The old Wasco County Courthouse in downtown the Dells is definitely eye-catching. The massive two-story brick building with the clock tower looming overhead stands out among all the nearby businesses. This building is said to be haunted by the only man hung on the grounds of the courthouse in jail. Is this story true? And how has this doomed man made his presence known after all these years? Welcome to Investigating the Northwest. This channel is dedicated to exploring the mysterious, haunted, historical, and beautiful of the Pacific Northwest. We have completed our exploration of Haunted Bend, Oregon, and now we've arrived in the Dalles to explore the various haunted locations in this town by the Columbia River. What city should I explore next? This building is the second Waskow County Courthouse. The first courthouse was built in 1859, but the needs of the town soon outgrew that location. A new courthouse, this one, was built in 1881. The original courthouse building was moved to 410 West 2nd Place in the Dalles, and the Dalles City Hall was built in that original location. In this new courthouse, the jail cells and the various county offices were located on the first floor, and the courthouse was located on the top floor. The heavy metal door to the jail is still in the building to this day. This impressive courthouse was built in the Italianate style and is still a stunning example of architecture from its time. The tall tower houses an 1885 Seth Thomas clock that had operated for over a hundred years. The town outgrew this location as well and built a third and final courthouse in 1914. For most of the interim time, the building was occupied by a fraternal organization on the top floor and a funeral home on the ground floor. The first organization to own it were the Knights of Pythias, but they sold the building to the Masons in 1929. The ground floor was rented to a funeral home in 1948, and it was named Smith Calloway Funeral Chapel. Here's a picture from 1961 with a funeral parking sign in front. It operated there until 2010 when the Clock Tower Ales opened the restaurant and pub that is still open today. Employees of the Clock Tower Ales have heard talking and footsteps when they were alone in the building after hours. One employee reported that a previously unknown alarm had gone off for no reason and it took them a long time to figure out where the alarm was coming from and how to turn it off. Others have reported that doors have locked on their own. There was even a local paranormal investigation team that would routinely take visitors into the building for ghost hunting EVP sessions. There have been reports of an apparition sitting in a chair on the stairs landing. And two theories for the hauntings have been proposed. First, that the building is haunted by the spirit of the only man hung on this property, Daniel Norman Williams who went to his death claiming his innocence. Also, the next theory is that the place is haunted by the many clients who have passed through the doors of the funeral home. Could the haunting stem from a funeral home formerly located in the building? Well, this explanation would be fact. In some instances, local legends claim that the building used to be a funeral home when in fact it never was. This building, however, absolutely was a funeral home for over 60 years. With 60 years of deceased people given their final care and services in the ground floor of this building, it's not unheard of that some of them may be lingering to this day. Could the building be haunted by a man hung on the property? This explanation is also fact. You may want to grab a coffee or a tea, settle back, and let me tell you a story about the case of Daniel Norman Williams, executed on this property in 1905 after being convicted of double murder. This was a very well-known court case that set a legal precedent and affects legal cases even today. This is in regard to the issue of corpus delicti, which translates to the body of the crime. 
It was one of the very first cases in which a suspect was convicted of murder and hanged without the presence of a body. In May 1899, Daniel Norman Williams and Alma Nesbitt moved to Hood River, Oregon. Although his first name was Daniel, he actually went by Norman in this territory, so that's what we'll call him during this story. Norman and Alma were engaged to be married, and they each filed a land claim for a piece of adjoining land. In July 1899, they were married in secret to make sure that they could finalize and secure their ownership of both land claims before they were married, because a married couple can only file for one piece of land, but as individuals, they could claim two, get married, and then retain both claims. Here, you can see the article stating that Alma Nesbitt and Norman Williams had their land claims surveyed in November of 1899. In this article, they are not listed as married because they're still keeping it a secret. They are joined that year by Alma's mother, Louise. The plot takes a turn when Alma finds out that Norman was still married to a previous wife, so their marriage wasn't legal in the first place. Alma moved away from the homestead and settled in Portland, Oregon with Louise. However, they were still visited by Norman, and on March 8, 1900, somehow, Norman convinced Alma and Louise to come back to the homestead in Hood River. Unfortunately, neither was seen again after that. Alma's brother, George Nesbitt, received his final letter from Louise postmarked from Portland, Oregon on March 8, 1900, the very day Williams drove Louise and Alma back to the homestead. Alma and Louise were very frequent letter writers, and George found it strange that the communication ceased after that. He wrote letters to Norman asking where they were. And Norman claimed that Alma had left him for another man and that he didn't know where she was. George even wrote to the postmaster in the Hood River area to inquire about the whereabouts of his mother and sister. Unfortunately, George was living in Iowa at the time, so he couldn't just drive over and check on them. He waited for further communication and started his own investigation. On June 23, 1900, or 1901, depending on which newspaper you read, Williams started tying the noose that would eventually hang him. He presented a letter to the county clerk from Alma, relinquishing her ownership of the land and signing it over to Williams. However, in the book Necktie Parties by Diane L. Gores Gardner, we learn that the county clerk remembered beautiful Alma from 1899 when she first filed the land claim. He found the situation entirely suspicious and thought the signature looked different than Alma's previous claim. So he wrote to the U.S. Attorney for the District of Oregon, John H. Hall, explaining he felt this letter was a forgery. John Hall sent for the original land claim, compared the signatures, and determined they were not the same. In October, in October 1903, a warrant was issued for Norman Williams for the crime of forgery. However, during his investigation, Hall also determined that Alma and Louise were missing, had last been seen in a buggy with Williams headed toward the property on March 8, 1900, and had never been seen again. The day after the forgery charges were announced, newspapers were also reporting that Williams was a suspect in the murder of both women. George Nesbitt was checking the Oregon news because he was still worried about his missing mother and sister, and he saw the wanted notice in the Oregon newspaper. And that is when he packed up and rode to the Dalles to look into the case himself. George arrived in Oregon in February 1904 and made arrangements with the local stable owner to see Williams and Alma's property in person. He brought with him a shovel. As he was examining the property, the half-built chicken coop really stood out to him. The ground underneath appeared to be dug up and a bit sunken in the shape of a grave. He brought out that shovel and dug six feet down under the coop until he finally found the damning evidence. George discovered blood-soaked gunny sacks, some long strands of silver hair, a chunk of dark brunette hair that still had skin attached, and a sharp piece of pottery with what looked like blood on it. George immediately took the evidence to Waskow County District Attorney Frank Menefee. 
Williams was arrested the very next day. He was arraigned for the murder charges on April 27, 1904, and a trial date set for May 23, 1904. Now, during the time that his sister and mother were missing, between 1900 and 1903, George Nesbitt was not just sitting around and waiting. He dug into the life of Norman Williams and uncovered a violent and disturbing past. George discovered that Norman didn't have just the two wives. In fact, he'd been married at least six times. Some newspapers speculated it could have been either seven or eight wives. The first two wives died of poisoning, and Williams had collected $2,000 in life insurance on one of them. His third wife was the one he forgot to divorce in Nebraska before he married Alma. Alma had then gone missing under suspicious circumstances. Williams had married a fifth wife in Bellingham, Washington, named Etta Jones, but she also quickly died. An autopsy showed she had high levels of arsenic in her system, or strychnine, depending on which news articles you read. In fact, he collected $5,000 life insurance after Etta's death, which he used to pay his lawyer to defend him on the murder charges of Alma and Louise. At the time of William's arrest, he was supposedly married to a sixth wife, Anna Zivany, who was charged as an accomplice in the land claim fraud case. The book Necktie Party says that they were married, but the newspapers at the time listed her as an intimate partner. Now they could have been married in secret, since he was known to do that, but I don't have verification either way. But was that all the dirt George found on him? Oh no. He discovered Williams had served three to four years of an eight-year sentence for assaulting his sister-in-law in in Nebraska. Ugh. Williams had thrown her down a well, hoping she would drown, then asked the neighbors to help him save her, only to find out that she hadn't actually drowned and was very much alive to tell authorities what happened to her. He was also suspected of killing an elderly couple in Iowa in 1902. The man wanted for that crime was a Dan Williams, and the physical description matched Norman to a T. This man was a predator, no doubt about that. Williams' trial began on May 23, 1904. The main theory was that Williams killed the two women, buried their bodies, and built the chicken coop over it. When authorities were really starting to investigate him, he dug up the bodies, burned them, and hid the remaining bones. Unfortunately, he didn't completely empty the grave, and he didn't completely refill it either, leading George Nesbitt right to the remaining evidence. Prosecutor Menifee built a thorough case against Williams. He even brought in a scientist who was a specialist in blood work. Dr. L. Victoria Hampton was a woman studying groundbreaking forensic techniques. She was able to use a brand new test to determine that the blood was human and not animal. She was also able to determine that the brown hair was also human and had been torn from the scalp rather than the hair being cut or having fallen naturally from the head. The defense attorney, on the other hand, presented no real case. He didn't call any witnesses or have Williams testify. He relied solely on the defense that if there is no body, then there is no proof that murder was committed. He claimed that hair and blood alone did not prove anyone had died. However, the jury was smarter than that, and on May 28th, it took only four hours to convict Norman Williams of two counts of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. The defense attorney appealed this decision, but the appeal was denied on March 15, 1905, and Williams' new execution date was set for July 21, 1905. He was hung at 6.15 a.m. and was the final legal hanging to take place in Wascow County. Williams is buried in St. Peter's Parish Center Cemetery in the Dalles, Oregon. This case set the precedent that one didn't need to have a complete deceased body to prove a death or a murder had occurred, that mere pieces of a body were sufficient. This was the only hanging that took place at this particular Wasco County Jail. There were two additional hangings in Wasco County prior to that, but those took place at the original courthouse on the corner of 3rd and Court Street. Those were Henry Dedmond and James Cook. 
The information about the case of Norman Williams is well documented in both the book's Necktie Parties, Legal Executions in Oregon, 1851 to 1905, by Diane L. Gores Gardner, and in Murder Out Yonder by Stuart H. Holbrook, as well as a multitude of news articles published during the trial. I highly recommend reading these books if you'd like to learn more about this case. The old Waskow County Courthouse is located at 311 Union Street in the Dalles, Oregon. This haunted location is open to the public, so you can visit and take a look at the ground floor, which used to serve as the funeral home. The restaurant pub is called Clock Tower Ales and is open seven days a week from 11 a.m. to closing. I was visiting before 11 a.m. or else I would have gone in for a snack and to look around. The garage in the back of the building is where a courtyard used to be located and where the gallows for Norman Williams were constructed. Employees have said that there were two windows in the back that are now bricked up that served as the observation area for the hanging. If you subscribe to the theory that some dates are more energized for haunting phenomenon, then here are a few dates to keep in mind if you're looking for a ghostly experience. May 28th was the date of Norman's conviction. And July 21st was the date of William's hanging. Maybe the anniversary of one of these dates will be more powerfully charged than others. Thank you so much for joining me today to learn about the haunted old Waskow County Courthouse and its fascinating history. Don't forget, if you're interested in learning about the mysteries of the Pacific Northwest, of exploring fascinating locations and discovering local legends, please do subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to receive an email whenever a new video is released. Thank you.